I started as actually as a candy striper in 1974 at the hospital. I went to Lathrop when we were split shifted and I got out of school at noon. East Lathrop went from 7 a.m. to noon and then West Lathrop came in from 1 to 6. So I was 14 years old and out of school at noon and I always wanted a medical career and so I walked over to FMH and was a candy striper there for over 1500 hours of volunteer time and really liked it and I remember going by the nursery so it used to be the babies were lined up in their cribs and I would walk by those windows and think oh my gosh that's got to be the best job in the world taking care of newborn babies how could I ever be that lucky to get that job and I had that job for 35 years and indeed it was a wonderful wonderful career so I really enjoyed that and then as I got older and I, I took a different route with education. I had always been teaching classes while I was in the nursery, pediatric advanced life support, neonatal resuscitation, and it just was a natural progression. Like, hey, you know, I was offered the simulation position and said, you know what, I think that'll be really fun. So for those of you who don't know what simulation is, just like airline pilots have to do simulate flight simulations constantly to keep their skills on track because you can't stop and think if there's a disaster you have to just act immediately and so they always are doing simulations and so is our staff so we keep the staff practiced up with mock code blues which is if you're doing compressions and ventilations we want people to just automatically go to the proper rate of compressions which i'm going to show you guys how to do tonight how to use an aed and just automatically go into that life-saving mode without having to really, oh no, what do I do now? So that's why we do simulations. So we do those for mock codes as well as other procedures that are high risk, low volume. So massive transfusion, for instance, if you have to give a bunch of blood to a patient, there's a special machine, the Belmont machine. Well, if you only set it up every three years, you know it's very confusing and so we have people practice it, that kind of thing, all the time. So it's kind of a fun job, I'm not going to lie. So uh, anyway, here we go, The Art of Simulating Health Disasters and the Science of Response. That's actually a title that Mike Powers came up with. Yes, I, <laughs> my uh, first partner in um, simulation and I, we were asked to do a presentation down in Anchorage. And it was for a bunch of physicians and healthcare pediatric professionals, and we call that talk How to Make Simulating Stimulating. And Mike didn't really like that, that title for this presentation, so he came up with this. But it is a matter of capturing people's interest, okay? And they have to be paying attention to what you're teaching, okay? So, and I also wanna point out that um, we use, I use these same slides with Stacy down, uh, some of the same slides but you'll notice that they're a lovely shade of purple with a little shade of pink up in the top corner. I thought that was lovely. So I hope you guys enjoy those purple slides as much as I do. All right, let's see if I can figure out. Okay, so code blue, I told you that we do that. But people don't just like lay back and be like, okay, go ahead and start your compressions. So what, when, do they, when do these things happen? We have our mannequin tripping out of the shower, falling onto the floor, hitting their head on the toilet, or we have them on the toilet. That's sometimes what happens too. And lately, we've added locking the door. So we'll put the patient, yeah, I know. This is my former partner in simulation, Jen Gerke, RN. We had lots of fun together as well. Mm -hmm. She'll recognize some of these scenes in the slides here. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, we've just started doing that. So then we put the mannequin somewhat like this in the bathroom and then lock the door. And then when the staff respond, they have to figure out how to get in that locked door. So that's been a nice addition as well as then tending to the patient. And here you see the staff tending to the patient. They drag them out of the bathroom, obviously. I put this down here because this mannequin we had had the head moulaged, which is trauma makeup. So we had a little bump and some bleeding on his head. So we're like, oh gosh, we've got to do this mock code. Why don't we just incorporate that into the mock code? So you'll see a little puddle of blood under his forehead there. And <laughs> thought it was a nice touch. And uh, so that's a, <laughs> 
That's my boss also in the back going, oh, sweet Lord in heaven. Um, so it just makes it more believable. Again, what you want is for people to buy into this. They're looking at a rubber man. You want them to treat it like it's a real person, okay? So as much as they possibly can. Then over here, this is some flight nurses. So we've started contracting to uh, local flight crews and we do simulations for them as well. So that's been a nice addition to our repertoire of things. Crash card scramble. Okay, so this is, Jen is already kind of giggling over this one because, um, okay, so I've been there for a long time. In um, September, I will have been at the hospital for 42 years. And for many of those years, did you just go, Whew. oh, <laughs> oh, it was okay. <laughs> I thought she, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I know, right? I can't believe it myself. Um, so anyway, uh, crash cart competency. So a crash cart is this red cart you see here, and it has all the equipment you're going to need at an emergency right away. Anything you need your hands on right away, called a crash cart. So um, forever crash cart competency and i worked with newborns with my friend deb grantham rn right here and so we only took care of brand new babies so when it came to doing an adult code we were like what you know and so then we had to learn how this adult crash cart was organized once a year and so what they would give us was this list of paper three pages long where do you find this needle this syringe just anyway it it didn't transfer over that it made any sense in two weeks from there. You couldn't remember what you saw. So I was trying to figure out, because we were then tasked with crash cart competency. We're supposed to train people on how to be competent in the crash cart. So I came up with this little idea of the scramble, and I ran it by my daughter, actually, first. And I said, OK, what if we make it a competition? Do you think people would go for that and give them a scavenger hunt list? And then, um, give them some incentive. Like if you go really fast, maybe you'll get a coffee card and a certificate with your name on it. Well, and not everybody is a competition fan. And so some people are like, no, no, not for me. And, but others are like, bring it on, Lori. They're taking their jackets off. They are ready to scramble. So I'm gonna show you what this looks like because I'm trying to add stress because even if you don't have a doctor yelling, Codes are stressful, right? You might have a family member crying. You might have, even though everybody would know what their job is, there's still stress involved. So I try to add that. Go ahead and play that video. Did you turn up the volume? That's me. I don't know how to turn up the volume. You can hear it okay? Okay. Go ahead. We're not done. Bring the mic over to where? It's a hard. It's a hard syringe to open. Okay, that's how that looks if you want to know. And that's my current partner in excellence, Dana K. Cook RN, Jen Gerke RN right there. Actually, she's a nurse practitioner now. Okay, so that's what it looks like. I'm hollering, get me this, get me that. Where, where is it? Where is it? I needed it yesterday. Give me this, give me this. And then we time them down to the one hundredths of seconds. And then we put their name on the wall of fame or the wall of shame. And yes, if they go really fast and they're the fastest of the month, their name is circled in gold or yellow highlighter, whichever. And then they get that certificate currently with a coffee card as the prize. But you also, just as I have those ER people that are stripping things off, like, I'll get this, I'll get that. You also have old OR nurse, Lori. I've had surgeons yelling at me my whole career. I'll get it for you when I get it out of the cart, you know? So, and there's no punishment for being slow, but there's that reward for being fast. Really, the whole goal is 
they learn where things are in the crash cart. Because none of us want to be that person at the crash cart, like, uh, you're looking for what, oh, you don't know, you start at the top and you move your way down. This way, people know. And it's really made a big difference. The Code Blue Committee is going, whatever you guys are doing, people are really good at the crash cart now, so well done. Okay, let's see. Okay, and the supplies, by sweetheart. That's my baby girl, she's gotta go to work. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so expired supplies. So we, um, we need the supplies that the hospital uses and we don't, we have like zero budget, right? And um, so we need to get a hold of these things. So what we do is we use the expired supplies. So supply chain brings us up big carts and we go through what can we use, what can we use? And this is all organized. I know we've donated some to the ski patrol. We've donated some to missions, medical missions. Sadly, often those are refused because from customs. If customs notices the expiration date, they'll often refuse them. But we do our best. And for free 99, we get to use these supplies for the, for the education. Okay, so this is an example of a, one of the simulations we do. So what this presentation is gonna show you is a variety of simulations we do, a variety of things we're asked to do, and how we meet the needs of the people that need the education. So this was for mass casualty. So the community participates in mass, mass casualty drills every year or two. I forget when the whole community. Do you know that, Jen Gerke, Yes. Okay. Well, um, this one was done, uh, it was based at Eielson. It was right before one of their air shows. And so the disaster they were staging was one of the planes hitting a school bus or com coming near a school bus. Lots of children and burns. So the whole community came up and we had real people in the sim world, those are called standardized patients, but I say real people, um, moulaged, which is trauma make it, to make up, to come into the emergency room. But we can't, you know, ventilate, do compressions, that kind of thing on a real person. So we took our mannequin and I put this, uh, put these burns, these little blisters and burns on him. And then, you know, they don't come in completely trauma naked as they, as my, first partner Stacy would say, they have clothes on and the clothes have been burned as well. So we went, well, we might as well burn some clothes and put on him. And then as Stacy and I were heading out to the parking lot, we went, well, there's cameras everywhere. We better let security know. We're gonna be out there with matches and fire out in the parking lot. And <laughs> so when we called security, they went, Oh, for crying out loud, yes, you guys can go, but we're going to help you so you don't start a fire, which we thought was unlikely. It is an asphalt parking lot. But so they came with, um, this is the security officer's boots, <laughs> and he's stomping out a flame. You can see that smoke there. Anyway, we were doing our best with matches, and it wasn't working out. So then we called engineering, and they brought the blowtorch. And so they were very excited to help us out. I got to tell you, <laughs> we got a lot of gentlemen, security, and a blowtorch. Good times. Good times in the parking lot. OK, so another kind of a simulation that we do. So again, for pediatrics, we had a rollout of a new policy for di diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA. So sometimes children out of the blue. One of our coworkers, her one-year-old, suddenly came up with diabetes, okay? So <clears throat> there's a whole process, and it's different than when adults get diabetes. It's treated differently. So this policy was rolled out, and we had to educate about 120 staff nurses, ER nurses, peds nurses, ICU, and float nurses. So we had a huge rollout that needed a lot of hands-on teaching. So how are we going to do that? And we have one pediatric mannequin. So we took some quadruple amputee mannequins. You can see we added the little arms with the gloves for hands and the pajama bottoms for the legs. And um, we lined them up so they could be the patients. Then um, we had expired IV fluids, which we then had pharmacy label. Because these are all the bags of fluids that have to happen for PEDS DKA. 
this is one of the, that's one of our sessions. We had six or eight sessions like that with all that staff. And um, so they're learning how they calculate the fluid rates, which pump gets what fluid, and then we have all the pumps lined up for them too. It's, it's nice hands-on because it's one of those things that changes constantly. They're recalculating the fluid, recalculating the drips. So it's a, it's a good way for them to get that tactile sense of learning. Okay, so this is one of my favorite things to show people. If you're medical, you like that, please be aware no piglets were killed for this demonstration or that we use in simulation. Okay, it turns out Mother Nature, pretty cruel. Baby piglets die. They're either too big to get through the birth canal and that one dies and the next ones die too or the mom rolls over on them. So that's how we get these piglets for education, just so you know. So um, I happen to be teaching a camp here for the University at ASRA, Alaska Summer Research Academy. And I was teaching the biomed camp and I happened to have had this extra piglet and I put it in my freezer after the camp was over because I was thinking, gosh, it's such a great learning opportunity. I don't know when I'll be using this again, but why should I throw it away? And so then, um, as luck would have it, then I was asked to teach chest tube insertion for nursery nurses and the process of that. And I went, gosh, I'm an old nursery nurse. I remember we used to transilluminate all the time to find a pneumothorax. So what a pneumothorax is, is there's a hole in the lung, okay? You're, this, the preemie perhaps is on a ventilator and their little lungs are, are fragile and a hole gets popped in the lung. So actually the lung still inflates with a hole in it, but what happens is every time there's a breath, that air escapes and it goes into the closed chest cavity. So it builds up pressure and every breath, a little more pressure, a little more pressure. So now there's so much pressure in there the lung collapses. It, it doesn't have room to expand anymore because there's so much pressure. And that's why the doctor will put in a chest tube. They'll put in a tube to get rid of that air and let the lung re-expand. Well, I worked night shift with my friend Deb Grantham RN here. And um, so we would be having these babies and it's like two or three o'clock in the morning and you're going, oh, I don't know, I think this kid might have a pneumothorax. Let's transilluminate. So what that looks like is if you, do, you dim the lights in the room, and those slides are kind of hard to see, but this one is better, I think, over here. The first picture you can see, I'm shining the light on the chest, and all you see is that little ring of light around your light source. That means there's not a pneumothorax there. That lung is doing fine. The second picture, if you guys can see that bubble of air that lights up, and you can even see rib shadow, there's my pneumothorax. That's that air in the chest and that the light has allowed me to see it. So then Deb and I could, could call the doctor and say, hey, we just transilluminated. This baby has a pneumothorax. We'll see you soon, doc. Meanwhile, we could get the x-ray, get everything set up, and they can come in and decompress that. So it was huge. So the, the exciting thing about this for me is how far neonatal medicine has come since I started there in 1981 but also how um, this is now in the neonatal resuscitation book, the handbook, like how to transilluminate. And that's kind of cool, except for their picture is with a mannequin, which it's very confusing. You have no idea what are they trying to show you, but with this picture, you know right away, you can see the difference, right? And it's really, we've done teaching for flight crews, because if you're in the air, you have no access to x-ray, right? And so they can say, boy, my baby is not doing well. Let me transilluminate it. Oh, there's a pneumothorax. Let me decompress that and my baby will get better. And the same with ambulance crews out in the field. So it's an exciting tool to have in your tool chest. Okay, so then this goes on. So now you've discovered your pneumothorax and you have to place a, uh, you have to place a chest tube. So this picture, we were doing chest tube setup training with our NICU nurses and our pediatricians are putting in chest tubes, and then these are NICU nurses that are assisting and then also getting the chest tubes set up to be in the pleurivac thing. Everybody needs practice with this because it's high risk, low volume. Thank goodness it's low volume. Okay, so then this is the other thing that we discovered, piglets have an umbilical cord with two arteries and a vein, just like a newborn. 
So what's cool, well, I don't know. Oh, there we go. What's cool is that we can cannulate that vein in their umbilical cord and give them fluids and medications, okay? And just like the piglets. So this is Dr. Bruner training some ER nurses on how they can assist her putting in a line, okay? And she's using the piglet for help. And so that's just what those are. In the middle is Dr. Livengood. He was getting ready to do a trauma presentation and he wanted a chest exposed. So later in the video, I have that video of him having exposed the chest and ventilating the newborn. I think it's super cool, but I didn't know if other people would be uncomfortable by it. So we'll have that a little later. And you can look or close your eyes, whichever you choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It's up to you, ladies and gentlemen, up to you. Um, okay, so, and this is UVC, so that's umbilical venous catheter placement practice. So we were doing a simulation with a mom, a postpartum hemorrhage mom, an emergent delivery, and then, okay, now this baby needs all these procedures. So what kind of makes my heart happy about this is the young lady with the blue vest and the ponytail that's got her hands on the piglet, she was from Boston, Boston General, and she was gonna be a pediatrician like two months after this. She was gonna have her white coat and be able to be a practicing pediatrician. But she got very little hands-on practice with actual flesh. They did everything with mannequins. And she said, oh, the pediatricians, we're at the bottom of the pile here. We get, um, the surgeons get first dibs. If somebody needs a chest tube, then it's this one, then it's that one, and she's like, I have never done this. And so we went, come on, girl, we're gonna give you a piglet to work with. And so she was beyond excited. She kept taking selfies with herself, doing all these different things with the piglets, sending them to her friends in Boston. And they were like, you're so lucky. How come we don't have that here? I'm thinking surely they love ham and bacon in Boston, right? There's gotta be pigs around there, but I don't know. Nobody thought of bringing a piglet in. And um, so she was, she thought it was the greatest thing ever. And she was putting in a chest tube. I, I've only got the picture of the UVC here, but she was putting in a chest tube and there's this certain pop as a physician, you're gonna feel that, and you don't see that in a mannequin. And so she did that with the piglet and she was like, oh, is that the pop? And we're like, yeah. And so how great was it that the first time she experienced that was not with your child, yeah? So she kind of got that. And how to secure it, how to put it in, how to thread it in, very exciting stuff. Okay, this is Dr. Nace, and she's kind of hamming it up. Oh, hamming it up. No pun intended, just a happy accident, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, she's teaching this medical student how to intubate put an ET tube down a tiny airway, and then the nurse is assisting by putting cricoid pressure on, and that's something we do all the time for the doctors. They, you, you scope in there, they see the trachea, but some, they, they try to see the trachea, but if me as a nurse can put a little pressure on there, cricoid pressure, they can see it better. And that's why we're showing right there. And then this is Dr. Bruner doing the same, and you can see the nurse doing the cricoid pressure on the neck. And again, you can't, mannequin doesn't make any difference. So this is valuable learning for everybody. And these are ER nurses looking on to see what she's seeing. Okay, OB simulation with Noel. So what I wanted to do at this point was kind of stop with the piglets, just in case it was making somebody uncomfortable, and show you how we, <laughs> how we would do this with a mannequin, okay? So okay. I'm just so this is the size of a premature baby. Mm, I'd say about 28, 12 to 14 weeks early, would you say, Deb? So about three months early, this baby is, and this is the size they are. So lots of training going into this, and, and you can see the little cheeks are blue. We're making them. Um, this was, do you remember how much it costs? No, we got Chris Trudgen RN. No. Do you remember? We got a good deal, <laughs> but I still want to say it was like Amazon three thousand or something. Yeah. yeah. Six thousand. Okay. Yeah, thousands of dollars. And thanks to the generous donations of people that donate to the Sim Lab, we were able to cover the cost of this, which was very exciting. In fact, one of our prime 
benefactors had a grandchild in the NICU and she was like, I want to benefit people so they learn about taking care of premature babies, okay? So a lot goes into the teaching, but I, what I wanted to show you is, remember, we're talking about simulation being, you want people to re respond by rote without even really having to deep think what they're doing. So I'm not gonna teach a whole neonatal resuscitation thing, but I am gonna tell you how I teach people how to ventilate and do compressions for a newborn. And so we would dry this little gal off, okay? And I would do a lot of assessing things. And then if I determined by the heart rate that I was gonna have to ventilate, here's my little Ambu bag right here. And American Heart would tell, oh, I forgot to tell you. When we do simulations, we make sure everybody knows they're not gonna fail. Because what does fail stand for, Jen Gerke RN? First attempt in learning. First attempt in learning. Do you love that? I did not make that up, but I think it's brilliant. And we tell people that right from the very beginning. You're not gonna fail this, you're here to learn. So I did not make up that, but I did make up this. So American Heart, and I'm a little proud, a little bit proud. Um, so American Heart wants you to use the EC method of holding on an Ambu bag. The capital E, is holding up the mandible, and the capital C is holding down the mask. I think your hand looks like an eagle claw, ca -ca, which begins with EC, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I did make that up, and again, I'm a little bit proud about it. Mm -hmm. But people do remember their eagle claws, you know, when they can't get the baby to ventilate. So then, I'm going to, I'll stand off to the side here, use my E to hold this up open, move my C there, and then this is how I'm gonna ventilate. Now, the book will tell you you're gonna ventilate at 40 to 60 times a minute. So every one of you here, even by the end of the night, you might be able to get that question right on a test. But then when the baby comes to you, people are like, what does, that, what does that feel like, 40 to 60 times a minute? So what I tell people is, we are going to waltz, ladies and gentlemen, at this birthday party. And we are going to breathe two, three, 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 da 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 depending on whether you are a fast waltzer or a slow waltzer, you will hit 40 to 60 times a minute. And people remember that. I've even had a physician call me at 10 o'clock one night and go, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you do that waltzing thing. It helped me at the two codes I had to go to back to back tonight. So it's kind of calming you down. So then if you have to add compressions, we're still dancing at the birthday party, but now the compressor is going to have to compress like one and two and three. Breathe, one and two and three. You're gonna to pause to let your ventilator breathe. So then I tell people, we're still dancing, we're switching it up, it's a Congo line. One and two and three, breathe, one and two and three, breathe. Okay, so I do that and people remember in an emergency, right? And so I am very happy to be a Fruit Loop in front of the students if it helps them remember, okay? And so that's, that's kind of what this little one looks like. So I'm gonna leave this out. So at the end, if you'd like to take a listen, I can change our heart rate, I can change your color, and I brought a stethoscope, brought some alcohol pads, you can wipe off the stethoscope if anybody would like to listen to that, okay? So that is Noelle. She's our birthing mannequin. The only thing she can do is push a baby out of her lady parts, okay? And I can adjust how fast or slow the baby comes out of there. And so, are we good? Um, but she has really no other capabilities. And so it's hard to believe she's an actual, you know, person when you're going to this simulation. Now, this is, you see behind her neck, I put a cell phone on speaker. And so the nurse can talk to her and actually, we put Jen Gerke RN on the other phone. She's got labor and delivery experience and she can talk back as if she's the voice of Noelle. So the nurse can be asking her questions. She can do all this stuff. And so that is okay, okay? That's pretty good, not perfect. And uh, the next slide is I think why Mike Powers may not be here tonight. He was a, <laughs> he was a little afraid I would pull out the Nike bird suit, right? And so what we have done to make people believe it yeah, <laughs> more, uh, more than anything is on a budget, we got a nude bodysuit. Hold on, that's a very anticlimactic. I'm hitting the button and it's not moving forward. Yeah, 
Dun, 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 dun. I'm trying to, there we go. So for $36 from Amazon.com, we got the nude colored bodysuit. We got a hairnet from the cafeteria that we put down at her nether, yeah, yeah. And we named the hairnet Tangles, by the way. And um, then we have some expired Band-Aids for nipples, okay? Now, this is much more convincing when it's on a person's body. But Mike was very reluctant <laughs> to have that happen. I will tell you, the last slide here is when Stacy and I did the presentation down in Anchorage, she did come out with this suit in the Captain Cook Hotel in front of all those physicians and it was an attention grabber, I'm not gonna lie. So I have included that slide. If it doesn't make you uncomfortable, you can stay and look. If it does, close your eyes. Yeah, and so anyway, <laughs> you can see in the first picture, there's a little loop of umbilical cord. So we do use this all the time. Jen Gerke has been our model several times, like a prolapse cord, and then with Noelle, you can't really position her, all that stuff, but a real person, what do you do? The other thing is, like for postpartum hemorrhage, there's a lot of, we, we make a blood clot out of cherry jello and pie cherries, you're welcome for that tidbit. And it goes right down there, where you'd expect it to be. And um, that, when you clean up after something like that, um, the person, sometimes the nurse will just move the chucks, and if you have a real person in that suit, they can tell you, listen, I had blood all the way up to my shoulders and nobody changed the sheets up there. They just changed the chucks, which the mannequin's not gonna tell you. So this has been really an effective learning tool for $36. And of course, just the hairnet from the cafeteria. Okay, so MRI safe. So this was another simulation we did when um, the MRI inside the hospital went down and so all MRIs were having to be done in the imaging center. Okay, so, and that was down for, oh, I don't know, a month, six weeks, it was down for a while. So as simulation nurses, they call on us to be, okay, how are we gonna manage this? How are we gonna get people there and back? So we have this blow up alien because as it turns out, apparently if you Google blow up child doll, that is not a good thing. And so we've got the blow, it, it does something bad to your Google feed. And so I don't know because I didn't do it, but somebody else did and was like, oh dear. So we have the blow up alien to simulate the child. And so um, we went to the, so that was the problem because children, you can't say, hey honey, you sit tight for 45 minutes in this MRI, they're not going to, right? So you have to sedate them. And so they have to be monitored and an anesthesiologist is involved. So we had Dr. Bach helping us. We had float nurses, rad nurses, pediatrician, everybody like, okay, what's this gonna look like team? And so then um, we, we got the child, alien, out of the MRI, put him on the stretcher so there's an MRI safe stretcher, because you might be aware you can't take anything metal in there, so we can't take our stretchers in there. So we take this MRI safe stretcher in there, which you see there, and then the dilemma was, do we leave them on the MRI stretcher or do we move them over to a big ER stretcher? And so the team decided, let's just leave them here, we're already there. Well then that, what we learned was that turned out to be the wrong decision because that stretcher does not go very fast and the wheels are a little wonky. It's really only designed to take them from the MRI out of that suite to the regular stretcher. So that already was valuable information. Also valuable learning was when you go from the imaging center down to the hospital, there's a very long hallway. There's a little hill there. Mm, mm. So when you're going downhill, you pick up a lot of speed. Mm -hmm. So that was valuable learning as well. So, okay, so community outreach. So these are caribou legs. If you think they look like caribou legs, you're right, they are those. Um, this is volunteer ambulance folks. So you probably already know this, if you are living out of town, or if you ever, ever drive out of the city limits, you will be getting volunteer ambulance crew to take care of you. So it behooves all of us that they're well-trained, right? So we want to be a part of that training. 
So what we're training these folks is to put in an IO, an intraosseous needle. So it goes through the bone into the bone marrow and you can infuse drugs and fluids and that kind of thing. You would do this for somebody who was shut down to the degree you couldn't get an IV in very successfully. So we're letting, and it's in a drill, it's very exciting. So you drill that needle straight into the bone. So they're all practicing that on the caribou legs and then also the piglet because as um, luck would have it, baby's bones are very soft and it's easy to go all the way through. So we want our crew to practice stopping at the marrow and not going all the way through. It's tricky, not gonna lie. Okay, the same crew. This is one of our favorite things. This is the vomiting mannequin. We call it the vomican. And it's got this bucket of, we make this bucket of vomit with the vinegar. We've made it green. And it's got a pump and a drill. And so we've got it rigged up to make the vomit come of, out of where the stomach would be in this mannequin. But what happens is these people are trying to put in an advanced airway, an endotracheal tube, and it makes people gag. And so if they're, if they're going in for surgery, that's why they tell you, don't eat anything before surgery, right? They don't want you to have a stomach full of food. But if somebody's in a car accident right after they went to pizza or something, then they have a stomach full of food. So anyway, we're trying to give them practice with the vomican. And it's a variable speed drill. So if somebody comes in with a lot of confidence, like they can do that, I might pick up the speed on the drill. Not gonna lie, ladies and gentlemen, not gonna lie. And so it can be fast or slow, my choice, yes. And so that's what it looks like. Everybody loves that though. Everybody that participates with it, they're like, oh my God, I love the bomb again. So, okay, difficult airway. Uh, the op operating room had somebody come through with a, a stick through their neck, a, p a part of a chair went through the patient's neck and anesthesia was like, you know, we'd like to practice that again, you know, practice that with the crew. How are we gonna handle that? So I went out to the parking lot and I got a stick and we dressed it up and kind of looks convincing. Okay, this was another kind of fun thing. Uh, paracentesis is when a physician needs to go in, the patient has a bunch of fluid in their abdomen and they need to draw the fluid off, okay? The person's getting bloated and they have all this fluid. So they know how to do it. The physicians know how to do it. That was not the problem. They had gotten new instrument trays and this new ultrasound. And so they're trying to do ultrasound and this, these new instruments at the same time. And, they're, and we looked online at these paracentesis training models and they're like over a thousand dollars and it's not that difficult of a thing. So I went, I think we can do this. So I took an expired OR towel, put rubber bands around it in the water jug. And then I had um, my friend, Julie Parker, ultrasound it. And she's like, Lori, it actually looks like bowel and ascites. And she's labeled it that way. The ascites is the fluid. So then I covered it with that pig skin. So you're looking at that going, well, no doctor's gonna believe that that's actually, they're doing a paracentesis. So it's all in the setting. I took a quadruple amputee mannequin suffering from alopecia, which is hair loss. And you see the towel arms just trying to, mm-hmm and then draped it on up. And so there's my pig skin on that bottle. And now it's where the tummy kind of would be if you don't deep think it, right? So that's what they, they use that for training. Stoma. So this, the nurse in the background that's standing up with his hand on the IV bag, BJ, he's awesome. He's a wound care nurse. He does a lot of the ostomies. So if somebody has a colostomy, an ileostomy, he does a lot of the help with that. And the procedures department had asked for some training on the colostomy bags and that kind of thing. How do they do it? So BJ did an excellent presentation on that. And then he wanted to add the fun. He's like, I want to make it squirting and they have to get it really fast. They have to put that colostomy bag on. So um, that's what he's doing. I mixed a little green pea baby food with some water and he's there squirting that out. And they had to be very fast and clean getting the colostomy bag on. He, you can see him smiling. He's actually laughing. Mm -hmm. Good times. Dialysis arms. So this was um, another nice uh, money-saving move. So we got new dialysis machines about a year and a half ago. And so the patients did not have to come to the room, uh, to the dialysis suite to get dialyzed. They could be dialyzed in their room. 
So we had to train all these nurses on how to do this. Well, the arms, just the plastic arms to practice, sorry, Mary, um, were like um, seven to $900. So ICU ordered one of them, and uh, then you couldn't even use an actual dialysis needle on it. You could only use a small needle, and we're going, well, that makes absolutely no sense. How is that gonna help them? So I kind of rigged these up. I took a rolled up baby blanket, glove, some memory foam, uh, some tubing, tattoo skin from amazon.com, and rigged up a fake blood supply, and it worked great. You could re-access re it over and over. It didn't leak. They could use the needles. They actually used. They were really happy. And you can see I have them lined up. I think I made eight of them or something. And even the people with the dialysis machines were taking photos like, oh, my God, this is really cool, you know, and it was cheap, 99. Let's put it that way. I did have to pay for the tattoo skin. But everything else was just what we found. So... Okay, now here's where we're gonna do another little video. So this, the emergency room asked us to do, one. actually one of the nurses wanted to do this trauma escape room for a trauma learning conference they were doing. So she had gotten this idea for an escape room and wanted us to help her institute it. So again, you, got, you have to have buy-in, right? So we started, we were lucky enough to have Missy Kohler working at the hospital then, and she also was an announcer for the news. And so if you could play that one video. I'm Missy Kohler on scene at Fairbanks Memorial Hospital where we have just learned there has been an explosion in North Pole at the BP power plant. We understand there is heavy smoke coming from the area and mass casualties. We are waiting for an update uh, from the hospital's PR department to find out exactly what's going to happen here as they have instituted a mass casualty alert at Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. We are asking everyone to avoid the area of Cal Street and Fairbanks Memorial Hospital as emergency vehicles will be transporting patients directly to the hospital and we are trying to avoid that kind of congestion. Once again, please avoid Powell Street and Fairbanks Memorial Hospital as emergency vehicles begin transporting patients to the hospital for treatment. Once again, we understand there has been an explosion at the BP power plant in North Pole. We'll continue to bring you updates as we know more. We had it look like an actual news footage and announcing Okay, there's been a mass casualty. We had a siren playing in the background, which came from my cell phone. Um, and we've showed this to everybody beforehand. And so then we had them go into the actual escape room. We had two going on at the same time. We'll go back to the slide now. There we go. This is nearing the end, folks. Um, okay. So down in this lower corner right here, you see Dr. Corsa. He was um, a trauma surgeon in, he's a military, but he was in Florida. He was in the Florida nightclub shooting that had lots of victims uh, at the same time. So he was here doing training on how, how do we handle that kind of a victim load like that, and he gave lots of great great in input. So then when he saw that we were doing this escape room, he's like, I want to do this. That looks like fun. And he did have a great time. So it started with you. Um, we had all these t-shirts on the floor with people's scenario, like what, what this victim has. And then they have to triage. So there's four levels of triage. And then if they got the right number in each thing, that was the number on the lock that opened the lock to get them into this room. Then they go into this room and they, um, they had to calculate percentage of burns. Again, the good folks in engineering with their blowtorch, happy to assist. Happy to assist. They got two blowtorch things. And the other thing about the blowtorch actually burning the clothes, they smell burned. Okay, when the people come in, they're already buying in because you've got these moulage victims, but you also have the smell of burning clothes. So it's nice and convincing. So there's that. And then Oh, it's not moving me forward. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a little, when you go from one thing to the next, there's a thing. I have very limited computer. Nope. I'm just trying to advance it to the next slide. In the, there we go. 
Um, I put this first slide in there because that's what it looked like in my car when I loaded the mannequins up there. <laughs> and it's possible I went through a drive up coffee stand like that. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping for a free coffee. It did not happen. Uh, but anyway, I just it was an attention grabber. And so then over here, you can see the people responding to the different, they had to calculate percentage. Then that opened a lockbox. They got them a bag of IV fluids. They had to calculate the right rate. It was, it was fun. And um, then they would get clues that came from that giant operation man board. And they had to put those little pieces into the big board. And, you know, kind of a good time. Okay, so here's the part that I wanted a little bit of hands-on with you good people. Um, it's very important, in my humble opinion, that all of you, and I've got some papers right here, that all of you know have your medical ID information in your phone. Okay, this is because most people do have a phone with them. And even if your phone is locked, do you have a locked phone, Jen Gerke, or did you just open it? No, the ADs are in the building. Oh, she does. We're going to do both of this. So is yours on? Is yours? Well, I can give you, I can anybody give you have a look? Okay. So, and I won't access. Okay. Oh, that's a cute picture. Okay. <laughs> so this is asking for face ID, and I'm not going to do it. Her phone is locked. Okay. I can't get in. I'm going to go down here to emergency. And then she, I'm not going to divulge her medical ID, but right down here in red is medical ID. Now, I can now touch medical ID and get who she is, who her emergency contacts are, and if she has anything in there, that um, health information that she wants the ER to know. So it's, I feel it's critical that all of you make sure your medical ID is in there, not because necessarily, thank you, Jen Gerke, RN, um, not necessarily because I have to find out, but your, um, the EMS crews, when they come to get you, if you've collapsed at Alaska Land or something, they have no idea who you are because you may have left your wallet, like I leave my purse in the car or something, I'm just, but I carry my phone, okay? So now they can get all that information and contact your emergency contact people and let them know. So I feel like that's very critical. If you do not have it in there, my partner in excellence, Dana K. Cook RN, has put this paper together. So regardless of whether you have an iPhone or an Android, these are step-by-step -step instructions on how to get that in there. The other thing are um, QR codes or whatever those little codes are that you can put it in your phone. Um, for the AED, pulse point AED. So that, she had that on her phone. If you have pulse point AED, and it is free, free 99, be, uh, it will show you a map of any AEDs in the area. And you can bring the map in, out, whatever. The other cool thing about it, it'll, it'll show you where there's an AED with a photograph of the, in the bottom of where in the building it is, okay? So, because what will save an adult is compressions and electricity. So, yes, you're going to call 911, but you need to get electricity as soon as you can. So, if you use that AED up, you're going to be in shock and awe the first time you pull that, uh, pull that map up. Okay, so at this point, I wanted to show you how you were going to do compressions and a put an AED on. And then I have those other slides for you if you don't care for that, <laughs> if you are interested in it. Okay, so I'm going to, Carol, I'm going to put this microphone down. Yeah? Okay. I'll turn that. Oh, you, or you want to hold it for me because... Oh, I can do it. Okay. Well, I just didn't know if you needed me to be on there. Okay, I'm going to put this out here. So I've got this mannequin here for all of you to try, if you would care for try to how, to how you would go about doing compressions on somebody. So you're going to say, well, you're going to say, wow, you don't have any arms or legs. You sure you want me to resuscitate you? But of course, every life is valuable. So we're going to resuscitate this person. Um, so uh, you're going to establish they're unconscious. OK, any, any, are you OK? You're going to try up for a pulse, no pulse. I'm going to immediately start compressions. With my elbows locked, I'm using the heel of my hand right here 
in the middle of their sternum, and I'm going down like that. You can see my, and we're going to about a rate of 100. So one, two, we're going to stay in alive, stay in alive. Bum, bum. I, could ring, I could sing the whole song for you guys, but I won't, okay? So meanwhile, I'm starting these compressions, and then you need to go get an AED. But don't, don't say, if, especially if you have a room like this, someone, someone call 911. Well, then I'm going to have every single one of you calling 911. So I'm going to say, you, call 911. You, go get the AED. You, help me with compressions. I don't have to know their names, although I happen to know them. Um, but I can point and ask for assistance, okay? So I'm doing these compressions. The AED comes, okay? So the stick, the pads are connected right to the machine. With this style of AED, it's plugged in, but the pads are in the package. Can I have you hold this again? And so you rip open the package and you pull the pads out. You are avoiding this amazing uh, little razor for chest hair. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty ineffective. But so this comes out like this and people are like, what on earth am I supposed to do? There's a photograph and I'm gonna show you. But what I wanted to show you is it's got this paper here. Okay, this is two, you peel that off. This is three, you peel that off. Well, where's one? Oh my gosh, what have I already screwed up and not done correctly? One was opening the package. There's the number one right there. So I like to point that out so people don't freak out, right, when they don't know what they've done wrong. Okay, so now we're going to place this AED on. Hold on. Now, here's another tricky little part. We're going to place this cross right here. Every bit of literature will say you place that at the nipple line. Mm. That's a rather ambiguous term, ladies and gentlemen, because as a healthcare professional, I can tell you those nipples travel south, okay? <laughs> and uh, they don't mean down here. And then when you lay someone with southern nipples on their back, they go east and west, okay? <laughs> so we are aiming for true north, ladies and gentlemen, true north <laughs> with the pads here. So that's where you're placing that little cross right there. There we go, true north, down the sternum, hallelujah, okay? We call, that spot. we call it the birth nipples. In the, We say, try to imagine where those nipples started at birth. They're not down here, right? Even though they happen to be there now, okay? So, yeah, uh, we laugh, but that is the God's honest truth. I am a trained medical professional, and I'm going to tell you, they go everywhere. So then you're going to turn this on. Okay, and unit okay. okay. Stay calm. Stay calm. Check responsiveness. Call for help. Mm. Help. Attach defib pads to patients. Bear check. Don't touch patients. Now Analyze. this is the important part. You've got to step back while it's analyzing. Don't touch. Patients. It takes about Analyze. ten seconds. Mm -hmm. Shock advised. Shock advised. Don't Okay, so it's important that you do not touch the patient or anything on you touching the patient. Stand back. I'm, I'm deferred. I'm shocking now. Shocking now. Okay, then I go. And then there will often be a metronome to help you do the correct rate. Okay? So I like to have everybody know how to use an AED and know how to do compressions because the life you save might be mine, okay? So I think it's an important skill that anybody who's walking around knows how to do that, okay? You can find an AED when you're at Alaska land or whatever, you do your AED, pulse point AED locator, you get this on, you're doing compressions, and you do stand back for the shock. Jen Gerke's mama was an ICU nurse and the doctor was standing over the patient like this with his tie touching the patient and they shocked, he was out like a trout. And uh, however, they did, he didn't die, praise the Lord, but um, it was just another patient. And sometimes you lose sphincter control when that happens. Mm. <laughs> just, <laughs> just putting that out there. Okay, so if, yes, 
in, in the sim lab, if you save a life, we play this. Hold on, I, I had it. Yes, yes. We have that in our mannequin, so when you save his life, you get to hear that. And we treat you with a lifesaver when you've saved their life. People love it. When we, these are grown adults, they'll go get their lifesaver, and then we'll say, oh, by the way, the green is not lime, it's watermelon. They are suddenly going back to the Lifesaver Bowl, changing out their Lifesaver. Yes, they are. Yes. So, just wanted you to see that. Oh, she's got that. Okay, so I was going to put my slides back up there. And this is all if you'd like to, you'd like, okay, I just went, oh, that's the one I wanted. Oh, oh there's the next one. Okay, <laughs> so I did want to thank you. Hope you enjoyed the purple slides with the little splash of pink. Are there any questions? I've kept it just five hours, five minutes over my one hour. Um, any questions at all? And I'm gonna remind you, if someone does ask a question, would you repeat it into the mic so that they pick it up on the camera? Sure, sure, and I can. They're in shock and awe. They don't know what, <laughs> there are no questions because they are afraid of what I'm gonna tell them. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is what I'm picking up, yes. Yes. We do. Yes, we do. I will say Lorna Illingworth. It, oh, the question. How do we coordinate with the borough for these mass casualties and mass disasters? Because, and that is important because different people do different jobs. So there, one of the people is Lorna Illingworth, I can tell you. She's with the volunteers and policing, and she's very, very linked in to... Um, where all the volunteers are because they have to get volunteers that agree to be moulaged. They have to get all the fire departments instructed on what's going to happen, what day. Um, the hospital, we need to know because uh, we need to know that this is going to happen and we have a staging area to put these people in. And it's a, it's a lot of work, but it's important work. And how do you keep track of the patients? So once they get, there's a coordinator inside the hospital, there's coordinators out in the community, and um, the word gets out, and it's really effective training. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, yes? Yes. I have a question myself. Sure. Um, how much do the work of nurses and EMTs overlap? Like, are they very similar? How, her question is, how much do the work of EMTs and nurses overlap? EMTs are customarily pre-hospital, and a, a nurse is in the hospital. So there are some EMTs that work in the emergency room, and um, as more like an ER tech, sort of, a nurse's assistant, really, and then um, they help ask, do, do whatever the nurse asks them to do. Yeah, but that's a good question. EMTs are critical. I can tell you that, um, you know, I've worked at the hospital forever, I've been a nurse forever, and um, I feel very s secure in my environment, every, especially, you know, I went to births, birthday parties, and every piece of equipment I needed was right there. O oxygen, everything I might need. But then I was um, one of the first medical people to respond to happened upon a bad accident on Chena Hot Springs Road with six people dead. <laughs> My girl Cheryl was with us, uh, six dead people. And it was very traumatic to me, even though I have all this training. Like, I could not get the driver out of the car. The door was all crunched. And so then the EMTs came. And I'm telling you what, they were my heroes. They're jumping on that car. They're cutting apart the car so that we can get in to try to help the people. And they're just doing it like it's their job, right? And I was like, oh my goodness, this was very stressful to me. And so I, there's my admiration for EMTs is through the roof. Yeah, <laughs> through the roof, because they are doing a hard job in hard places, right? So. Okay. If 
there are no other questions, I think what I'll do is let, if you guys are interested in trying to save a life with the CPR guy, or if you'd like to listen to my little baby mannequin or try that, you're welcome to. Otherwise, please have a nice evening and thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.